So thanks very much, Keith. Um, so I'll be taking you uh, all through these, these four items, um, starting by recapping the, the overall picture of our sitcom budget advice that, that you may well have seen Chris Stark presenting last week. Um, then I'll pass to our industry analyst, Cheryl McKenzie, who will present our uh, approach to, to this analysis. Then I'll run you through the detail of what's in our sixth carbon budget balance pathway. And finally, the policies required to actually um, enable this ambitious pathway. So let's start with a, with a recap of the overall path. So the chart here sets out our recommended path for emissions towards that net zero goal in 2050, as indicated by the dotted line here. It also contains the, the two ultimate recommendations of our analysis, and that's our advice on the sixth carbon budget level and advice on the level of the UK's 2030 NDC. So firstly, we recommended that the UK should submit an NDC requiring at least a 68% reduction in territorial emissions from 1990 to 2030. And, and that's, that's a really ambitious goal. Uh, and and, that, and, and the, the, the government have accepted this uh, ahead of, uh, they, they accepted this on uh, last week, uh, ahead of um, last Saturday's climate ambition meeting. Um, so secondly, um, we recommended that the, the sixth carbon budget should be set at 965 megatons, implying a 78% reduction from 1990 to 2035. So just that's really ambitious. Just, just remember that until last year, the 2050 target was for an 80% reduction. Um, so we expect the government to assess our recommendations before, uh, before legislating on the, the sixth carbon budget level next year. And before, before moving on, I'll just, just highlight here the kind of inverted S shape of, of the path, uh, reflecting um, acceleration in, in decarbonisation in the early 2030s. So that's the, the overall pathway. Um, but now we want to, to dive into the, the detail on manufacturing, construction and fossil fuel supply. And I'm going to hand over to Cheryl McKenzie, our industry analyst, to explain the approach we've taken to develop our pathways and in these sectors. Thanks, Aaron. So we take a bottom-up approach to our analysis, which allows us to draw out the detail of each of the sectors. And we develop pathways for all of these sectors to underpin the overall pathway that Aaron just set out. For this session, we're focusing on the pathway for the manufacturing and construction and fuel supply sectors, which are the top two wedges on this graph. This is what we formally referred to as industry. We're shifting away from the term industry now to allow us to articulate the distinct issues for manufacturing and fuel supply. All of the 2019 emissions in fuel supply shown in this graph are from fossil fuel supply. And we're gonna cover decarbonization of these emissions in this session. Other aspects of fuel supply, particularly the development of hydrogen and bioenergy fuel supplies, uh, we're covered in yesterday's energy sector deep dive. So next I want to explain how we develop the pathways um, for manufacturing, construction and fossil fuel supply. So we started by developing three exploratory scenarios. These describe different potential future worlds. So widespread engagement um, is a world with further behaviour change and has a high level of resource efficiency driven by consumer and business engagement. Most businesses in this world follow incentives and supply chains develop faster. In the widespread innovation scenario, fuel switching and CCS show big reductions in electricity and electrolysis costs and higher CCS capture rates. Resource efficiency is at a moderate to high level, which is driven by innovative techniques and business models. The headwind scenario has moderate levels of resource efficiency and businesses that are resistant to change and prefer to retrofit rather than refit despite incentives. There are also lower cost reductions in this scenario. 
Tailwinds takes our most optimistic assumptions about the future world. This scenario reaches net zero by 2042 across the economy. Our balanced net zero pathway is a pathway that underpins the six carbon budget. It takes a balanced mix of assumptions about the future and keeps our options open. The balanced pathway is consistent with climate science and our international circumstances, and we need deep reductions to keep that 1.5 degrees in play. It's especially important going into 2021 with the UK leading COP26. So now I'll hand back over to Aaron to go through the changes that are involved in our balanced pathway. So, so thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Cheryl. Um, so Cheryl's introduced you to the, the balanced net zero pathway. And I'd like to take you through the, the detail of, of what it can, contains. And, and as Cheryl described, we'll, we'll split this between uh, manufacturing and construction, Firstly, and fossil fuel supply, and treat those those two separately. So, so first, um, manufacturing and construction. And here's the the balanced net zero pathway for, for this sector in in one graph. And um, it shows a, a series of measures reducing emissions from the from the baseline uh, down to at the top and then down to the balance pathway that's running along the bottom. Uh, it requires manufacturing and construction emissions to be reduced by 70% by 2035, and by 90% by 2040. And that's from 2018 levels. That's based on fuel switching, CCS, and improvements to resource and energy efficiency. So this pathway has faster reductions than the pathway underpinning our fifth carbon budget advice that we set in 2015, five years ago. This reflects substantially improved evidence, and also the shift to an economy-wide net zero target from the previous 80% target. If you in include the uh, negative emissions that come as a result of BEX that, that's partially shown in the light green wedge here, then the pathway does in fact uh, reach net zero overall, which is, is, is pretty impressive for, for a sector um, that, that's often been uh, referred to as hard to carbonize. So let me take you through the pathway and let me start with the, the, the early years. And during the, the 2030s, there's increasing implementation of new technologies, policy, resource efficient approaches, the development of infrastructure and supply chains. And um, improvements in resource and energy efficiency lead to the, to the largest reductions in the early 2020s, uh, with a smaller contribution from electrification, biofuel use, and, and material substitution. And then fuel switching CCS deployment really scale up um, from, from 2025. So now let me take you a bit further towards, uh, towards 2050 and go through each of the wedges. And to do this, I'll, I'll pop up this chart um, to show you how the, the different wedges of abatement um, are spread across the, the different industrial, uh, industrial sectors. So firstly, the, firstly resource efficiency. Uh, resource efficiency abatement gradually increases from 2020 to 2035. Uh, the category includes a range of different measures, including reducing the amount of material uh, used by optimizing designs, um, for example, in buildings, um, increasing recycling and reuse, including in construction, in increasing the longevity of products, for example, electron using electronics for, for longer, increasing product utilization and sharing, such through car clubs and sharing leisure equipment. Uh, and these measures we can see from the right-hand chart, uh, reduce emissions most from the steel and cement sectors. And this analysis is based on work by the University of Leeds. Next is, is energy efficiency, which includes heat recovery, process up and equipment upgrades, and integration and clustering. Um, the paper sector sees the, the highest fraction of abatement 
from energy efficiency uh, as a result of clustering to reuse waste heat from other industrial sites. Uh, this analysis is based on the 2015 uh, Joint Industry and Government Roadmaps to 2015. Next is the two, two, well, the two largest wedges, also the, the largest sources of fuel switching, that's electrification and hydrogen. And we've done some really detailed work on, on these options, as well as the CCS measures with, with Element Energy. Um, electrification includes uh, measures such as electric boilers, electric arc furnaces, electric dryers, and, and a range of other, other different measures. Some electrification options are introduced in the early 2020s um, due to higher commercial readiness. Um, and some electrification measures involve scrapping existing assets before the end of their expected lifespan. This reflects preferable economics over the, over the alternative options uh, and the, the inability to, to retrofit some, some electrification options. Hydrogen measures uh, include hydrogen boilers, generators, mobile machinery and kilns. Um, our latest evidence suggests that these measures can typically be retrofitted, uh, limiting the, the need for, for a to wait for a replacement cycle um, or the need to scrap assets before fitting these measures. Um, in our scenario, there is substantial electrification in food and drink, paper, uh, vehicles, steel and chemicals. Um, and there's substantial hydrogen and off-road mobile machinery and chemicals. So we, we expect the competition between electrification and, and hydrogen um, is likely to be, to be close. So there's a, a lot of uncertainty about uh, which of these technologies will, will ultimately win in the, in the future. And our exploratory scenarios that, that Cheryl set out, set out um, more of this uh, uh, potential more of these potential different future worlds um, if you want to dig into those a little bit further. Um, but uh, it's, what's key here is that developing both options will be uh, important. So then finally, there is bioenergy use and CCS. Uh, bioenergy use is prioritised for sectors using bioenergy already, such as um, cement and pulp, um, or those with the potential to fit, uh, fit CCS. Uh, CCS is applied to a bottom wedge, is applied to fertilizer plants, half of the UK's integrated steelwork capacity, and processes where it's the only deep decarbonisation option available. This includes cement and lime and ethylene production. So that's manufacturing and construction in, in quite some detail. Um, now I want to move on to um, fossil fuel supply. So the, the emissions from fossil fuel supply um, include, include those directly from oil refining, oil and gas production, oil and gas processing terminals, as well as leaks of methane from the gas transmission and distribution networks. Um, emissions in this sector um, are expected to, to see a substantial drop, even without climate policy, as a result of declining North Sea oil and and gas reserves. And, and that's why you see here the, the baseline, which is a baseline without any, any climate action, has a decline in emissions anyway. Um, including, uh, yeah, including this aspect, uh, our, uh, uh, and, and the abatement measures, our balanced pathway requires uh, fossil fuel um, supply emissions to be reduced by 75% and um, by 2035, that's from 2018 levels. And there's five major uh, measures that I'd like to flag here. Um, so the first is actually a measure that's outside of the sector, uh, which is a shift away from uh, using petroleum, uh, mainly in transport. And so that's this top uh, red wedge here. Um, uh, this reduces emissions from oil refining. Then second in yellow is, is electrification. Um, in our balanced pathway. This includes electrifying oil and gas platforms by collecting them, connecting them to uh, the electricity grid or to offshore renewables. Then next is the, the kind of pale green wedge, um, 
which is reducing uh, methane flaring and venting also from offshore platforms. And then similarly is the, you know, the kind of light, light blue wedge, uh, which is reducing leaks of methane from the gas transmission and distribution networks by improving monitoring of, of potential leaks and repairing the leaks. Then finally, um, CCS, which in this pathway is predominantly applied to oil refineries. So <coughs> by 2050, very close to, to zero emissions. And in fact, the, the largest remaining source of emissions is from methane leaking from old closed coal mines. So having gone through those pathways in uh, quite some detail, um, I want to take a, a moment to reflect on, on their contribution to the, to the carbon budget through this chart. And so it shows what's changed since our fifth carbon budget advice in 2015. So the, the red line um, uh, along, the, along the top here um, is our is the pathway that underpinned our fifth carbon budget advice. And the, the black line is, the, uh, is our new balanced pathway on the, uh, on the path to, to net zero as opposed to, to the 80% reduction, which is where the uh, fifth carbon budget pathway ended. And what we can see here is that the, the greatest change between the two pathways is from uh, what we formerly called industry um, i.e. the manufacturing, construction, and fossil fuel supply sectors. And, and I think this is a, a really important point. As a result of net zero and, and the Paris Agreement, uh, we really need to, to reset our, our expectations of industry decarbonisation. I guess, I guess more so, I think things have shifted more so than in, in any other sector. Um, it, and I guess this, this really means that it's not a case of decarbonizing industry last anymore. Um, it's decarbonizing alongside other sectors um, and indeed uh, faster than, than, than one or two. So I'd just like to cover a few other aspects of the, of the balance pathway. Um, firstly, uh, geography, infrastructure, and, and skills, and then on the next slide, costs. And um, so the, the map that just pops up here shows the distribution of uh, deep decarbonisation measures in larger manufacturing sites. We don't have absolutely all, all sites on, on, this, uh, on this map here. Um, so the, 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 lo the location of sites can, um, can affect the, the decarbonisation option uh, that they choose. Um, at dispersed sites, um, we, we, our, our latest evidence suggests that electrification has, has an advantage over, um, over hydrogen. Um, you can kind of see the, the, the bigger cluster areas in here. Um, uh, and the industrial clusters are where infrastructure for, for CCS and hydrogen are first deployed in our balance pathway, uh, starting from, from 2025 in some clusters. Uh, on, also on, on infrastructure, um, there's, there's also a need to, to increase um, electricity network capacity around some newly electrifying sites. Um, and and that's, that's spread, across the, spread across the UK. Uh, smaller and uh, more dispersed sites tend but not always, tend to decarbonize slightly later. This can be due to the costs of smaller sites, um, attitudes um, and, and infrastructure availability. Then uh, finally, as we move along the balance pathway, um, uh, the pathway has more workers acquiring skills to implement low carbon measures. Um, the supply of necessary technologies and equipment grows uh, and the availability of finance uh, increases. So the final aspect of the pathway I'd like to cover uh, is the cost, starting with manufacturing and construction. So the, uh, the, the kind of bluey purple line here 
um, reflects the additional capital expenditure required for fuel switching and CCS measures in the pathway, so the more expensive measures. And the, the red line here reflects the additional operating expenditure for the same measures. And then the, the kind of orangey line is the sum of these two. There's a, a fairly balanced split between uh, operating and capital expenditure, which, which differs from the story in, in, in many of the other sectors of the economy. And uh, based on, on these costs, uh, we estimate that the cost to, to the exchequer, um, if, if it were to, to fund uh, and fuel switching and CCS in manufacturing and construction in a way that protects subsectors at risk of carbon leakage, uh, could be up to uh, two billion pounds a year in 2030, perhaps a little less. So then adding, uh, adding in this line here for the net savings of energy and resource efficiency, it's actually a slight drop in the overall cost for decarbonizing manufacturing and construction. And then here I've added in at the bottom this yellow line, uh, which represents the cost of decarbonizing fossil fuel supply, which is closer to around a billion pounds a year. So adding all of this together, manufacturing, construction, and fossil fuel supply, um, the, the, the total cost um, peaks at around uh, five and a half billion pounds in the late 2030s. So I've run you through the, the pathway, but I haven't yet said um, uh, much about how this, this may be enabled. And we've, we've spent, uh, quite some time uh, thinking about this. Um, and alongside our sixth carbon budget advice, we've also published um, three, three other reports, uh, one by the Energy Systems Catapult, that's on policies to manage carbon leakage, one by the University of Leeds in CREDS, uh, the CREDS Research Consortium uh, on industrial decarbonisation policy, and one note on product standards um, from an independent consultant, Terry Wills, who has been working with us. Uh, we also gathered a steering group uh, to, to, to guide this work. So let me start with the area that I think we've looked at the hardest, which is about maintaining competitiveness of industry while decarbonising. Um, this is a really uh, important issue for the committee. Um, and yet yeah, the committee's position is absolutely still that the, the design of policies to reduce UK manufacturing emissions must ensure that it does not damage UK manufacturers competitiveness and drive uh, manufacturing overseas. This would, uh, wouldn't reduce global emissions and, and would harm the UK economy. So I'm going to go through and sort of highlight um, some of our key policy recommendations. So uh, in terms of uh, policy uh, mechanisms to, to, to enable this uh, goal of maintaining uh, competitiveness and also decarbonizing, we think that uh, in the near term, that taxpayer funding should be used to support deep decarbonization uh, in manufacturing sectors at risk of carbon leakage. Uh, this maps onto the two billion pound um, figure in 2030 that uh, I trailed in the in the previous slide. Um, this this support can provide kind of dual benefits of of managing carbon leakage, um, but also helping with early deployment, innovation, and bringing down the the cost of capital. Um, however, so over time, it's likely that the exchequer will not want to uh, foot the increasing bill of deep industrial decarbonisation. And to achieve this, uh, deep decarbonisation uh, will likely uh, require policies that uh, apl apply, uh, apply to imports uh, in addition to domestic production, uh, namely border carbon tariffs and uh, minimum carbon standards. And we've, we've set out a, 
a potential indicative uh, timing of, of different policies here, but, but there's an awful lot of uncertainty. Um, therefore, the, the committee thinks that um, uh, we need these options, these latter options to, to, be, to be made available. Although the committee doesn't go as far as saying um, they should be implemented. Um, developing these, these policies will, will be challenging and, and likely uh, take a long time. So the committee's taken that into consideration. Um, yeah, but what we recommend is that um, uh, development of, of these policies should should begin uh, developing the option of, ha of of having these policies should begin immediately uh, to to enable the the longer term options of either applying border carbon tariffs or minimum standards to imports of selected energy uh, intense products. Uh, this should next one. Um, this should include uh, developing um, carbon intensity measurement standards, mandating these are disclosed and fostering uh, international consensus around trade policies through the G7 and COP presidencies. Um, the next set of, of policies is around de delivering key measures to enable fuel switching and CCS. The committee recommends that the government should establish funding mechanisms to support operational and capital costs of both electrification and hydrogen in manufacturing. It should finalise the contract for difference mechanism to support industrial CCS and continue to support innovation and demonstration of fuel switching and CCS technologies. To enable resource and energy efficiency, the government should extend product standards uh, to cover how product is made. That includes aspects such as how repairable, durable and upgradable the product is and the level of recycled content. It should also work towards introducing a mandatory minimum whole life carbon standard for both buildings and infrastructure. There are several cross cutting economic issues that need addressing, um, mostly around market mechanisms. Uh, to address these, the committee recommends uh, that the government should create a clear incentive for uh, non traded manufacturing, those the sectors not covered by the, the, the the, well, the new UK ETS that we now know it will be, um, uh, by in creating that incentive, uh, and that, that incentive needs to uh, incentivize the switch to, to lower carbon energy sources uh, by reforming um, energy and carbon pricing. We also need to see a strengthening of, of carbon prices and taxes on manufacturers at current levels, they, they won't be sufficient to enable the, uh, the balance pathway. Uh, government should also reform electricity pricing to reflect the, the much lower costs of supplying low carbon electricity in the mid 2020s and beyond. And it also needs uh, to address manufacturers need for, for, for very short payback periods. Um, either through loans or grants, uh, potentially involving the new National Infrastructure Bank. There are also some crucial supporting policies required on infrastructure, jobs and skills. Uh, on infrastructure, the committee recommends um, that uh, there are at least two uh, CCS clusters established in the mid-2020s, mid at least four by the, the late 2020s and further clusters around 2030. Uh, government should work with the minerals industries to develop a detailed joint plan um, for CO2 transport from dispersed sites. And it should prepare to make decisions about whether initial areas of the gas transmission and distribution networks should be converted to hydrogen. It should also plan for a potential increase in large localised network reinforcement for manufacturers. Uh, on jobs and skills, um, the committee recommends that uh, industrial decarbonisation policies are, are designed in a way that creates and supports jobs, especially in regions uh, with reliance on, on industrial jobs and, and prompt toward of, of existing um, industrial decarbonisation funding 
can, can help with this and help with the recovery. Um, so all of, all of the um, above recommendations will need to be uh, wrapped into a clear and ambitious plan for decarbonisation of manufacturing construction, in particular through, um, its, uh, through, the, through the government's industrial decarbonisation plan a strategy that's, that's planned for, for spring. And this is uh, crucial to, to really bring momentum following the, um, the step change in, in ambition for industrial decarbonisation that's necessitated by net zero. Um, uh, on this ambition, um, should include uh, setting out how policy will enable deep decarbonisation while maintaining um, competitiveness and indicate ambitions by setting targets such as for oil for ore based um, steel making and cement production in the UK to reach near zero emissions by 2035 and 2040 respectively. Uh, plans also can't emit areas, so um, decarbonisation of off-road mobile machinery uh, should be covered somewhere in the government set of strategies. So finally, um, uh, covering policy on uh, decarbonising fossil fuel supply, although some of the, uh, some of the previous recommendations have, have, have cut across um, these, all, of, all of industry. Um, so we have these, these further uh, recommendations um, most likely sit within the, uh, the, the North Sea or should sit within the North Sea transition deal, which, which the government is, is uh, planning. So in this area, uh, the committee recommends that the lower cost measures are, are mandated. Uh, this should involve uh, setting a requirement that from 2021, any new plans for offshore oil and gas platforms um, must use uh, low carbon energy for their operations. And, and as a result, all new oil and gas platforms should have no direct emissions from operational energy use by 2027 at the latest. Uh, furthermore, from 2025, uh, flaring or venting uh, should only be permitted uh, when necessary for safety reasons. There's also more expensive measures that the government should enable. Uh, therefore, government should uh, develop a policy to reduce emissions from existing oil and gas platforms uh, in line with our balance pathway and develop carbon intensity uh, measurement standards for oil and for gas and oil by working with industry and the international community. This could help to, to, to manage uh, consumption emissions too. And finally, um, government should facilitate collaboration between the UK's offshore oil and gas sector and the offshore wind uh, sectors to potentially enable direct connections from platforms uh, to, to wind turbines. So that concludes the summary of our pathways and policy recommendations and uh, I'll hand back to Keith.